Uh, so, I'm going to try to wake up as I speak here. Okay? And uh, thank you for coming to this early talk. You're only one hour behind. Only, I know one hour. <laughs> for me, it's hard. Okay, so, um, so here's what I'm going to do today. I decided to give a little bit of an overview talk, um, knitting together many of the results we've had over the last five years or so on the disorder from Hubbard model 3D in, in uh, cubic lattice. And what I'll do is at the end, add in some new measurement, which we still don't know quite how to interpret, and we're very interested in getting uh, feedback about that measurement and how we should even think about it. What's a good framework for understanding it? OK, so um, for, for a while now, uh, my group has been picking away at a, a, an old problem, which has been discussed since the late 70s, which is what is the fate of interacting disordered quantum particles? And this is a problem which spans many different areas of physics, from disordered superfluids, um, absorbed in porous media, to arrays of Josephson junctions, high temperature superconductors, superconducting films, and things now which are being functionalized into devices, like thin films of transition metal oxides. At the root of understanding all of these material systems is really understanding this very fundamental physics question. Okay, so we do a lot of work with bosons. I'm not going to talk about bosons today, but if you want to catch up, we have a result that we're taking final data on now where we can finally see the mod insulator to Bose glass transition in 3D um, using core compressibility. We're quite excited about that. We can see a very um, clear transition. Today's about fermions, so I'll talk about experiments using potassium 40 atoms. And um, again, this is all in 3D with cubic lattices. And what I'm going to do is concentrate on um, showing you a thread where we saw uh, first evidence for a metal insulator transition, then um, evidence for a, a bad metal McLean system, or a supposedic key piece of information, and I'll end with recent results on double on lifetimes and uh, talk about you know, what is maybe a natural interpretation in terms of um, a phase diagram sampling and excited states. All right, so I'm going to sort of weave through these different results here. And I'll start with just a basic introduction to how our experiments work. Um, I don't think I need to go through this in too much detail here. I give a lot of talks in the next matter, so I'm going to try to do well on this. But we have an experiment that's it's slightly old-fashioned, where we trap and cool potassium-40 atoms um, in a glass cell in ultra high vacuum. Um, it's kind of an old-fashioned system where we actually move the atoms with a cart. We're trying to revamp this now to improve our cycle time. In the end, what we do is we magnetically trap and evaporate the cool atoms. Uh, transform them into a dipole trap and then superimpose a lattice on them. And again, it's a cubic lattice, so it involves three um, sets of kind of propagating resumes. Um, typical numbers are in that dipole trap, we cool from 10 to the half a microkelvin for some of the measurements we'll talk about today, um, 10,000 to 100,000 atoms, and the diameters may range from 30 to 60 microns. And then all the um, data come from pictures. Uh, a lot of time we take uh, time of flight pictures where we can measure the plasma momentum distribution of the atoms. And in uh, some of the measurements I'll talk about today, we take in-situ images just for atom counting. OK, so it's a pretty standard experiment. There's nothing uh, particularly novel here. OK, where things do get different in our experiment is when we add disordering. So to generate the disorder in these experiments, um, we use optical speckle. So we take 532 nanometer light, which is the color of this laser beam. We pass it through a high numerical aperture lens and through a holographic diffuser. Um, I actually have a piece of that here. It just looks like a dirty piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. And when the light passes through that thing, the, the diffuser scatters the light through a range of angles, only about a half degree. That's the reason we use this uh, very small angle diffuser. And then the atom, um, that light is uh, focused by the lens into the focal plane of that optic where you get an interference pattern, which actually looks just like that. So that's the optical field we use, and the atoms experience potential proportional to that light intensity. And what's great about these experiments is we can directly um, in situ image that um, speckle field of uh, microscopy, and this is what the disorder um, looks like. And I'll tell you more about how this combines with the lattice and what you should, how you should think of it in a few minutes here. So basically, it just looks like a disordered optical field, and the atoms experience, again, uh, potential energy proportional to the light intensity. You're shown false color. And we can tune the, light, the power in the light, the amount of watts of light that we use, and that changes the disorder um, strength, which we characterize as uh, delta, units of the recoil energy. 
And um, this, I'll tell you how to think about this parameter. One way you can think about that is it's this uh, standard deviation of uh, the variation in that. OK, so what we do is we add to that a cubic optical lattice, one with three pairs of, of uh, counterpropagating laser beams. This is a standing wave lattice in this experiment. So that adds uh, 3D qubit potential. Here, just shown in 2D, just taking 2D slice, but everything today is in a qubit potential, qubit lattice. And we control the depth of that potential using the power of these laser beams. That combines independently with that disorder potential, which comes down from another direction here. And that can be controlled, the strength of that disorder can be controlled independently with the light power there. And so it combines to form a disordered lattice, and that's actually data, that's what that disordered lattice looks like. And we trap two spin states of potassium 40 and that disordered potential. And those form our pseudo-spin, spin one half system. And so that system ex exactly realizes a disordered Hubbard model using um, those potassium 40 atoms. Okay, so this is how we make our dirty Fermi Hubbard model, what I just described to you. We've got those two spin states, potassium 40. We often use spin selective imaging um, in order to separately measure what those components are doing. Uh, we can label them spin up and spin down. And that disorder actually shows up in all the Hubbard parameters, in the tunneling energy, in the interaction energy a little bit, and in the site occupation energy, which of course we sometimes in a clean lattice don't keep track of that, but here you have to keep track of that because that energy varies from site to site in the lattice. And um, so this is how we get a Hubbard model. It's that minimal paradigm for strongly correlated electronic solids that many of us are studying these days. And um, the atoms can do exactly two things in there. They can tunnel, and that sets that tunneling energy there. And then they interact through a low energy collision, which sets that U, that interaction energy. And so we tune that ratio, U over T, by tuning the lattice potential depth, with, which if we make that much larger by putting more power in these laser beams, uh, those barriers get larger. Tunneling energy shrinks, and the interaction energy grows. And there's a nice Feshbach resonance in this atom also, potassium 40. So we also tune the scattering length using that Feshbach resonance and some of the measurements I'll tell you about today. OK, so that's how we tune these parameters. And then a really important aspect of this experiment, and one reason it's an interesting experiment from the point of view of experiments on solids, is that we know all those distributions of Hubble parameters. So many years ago, we worked with David Separley's group to do a Hubble decomposition of this potential, which is basically measured again. And here's what the distribution of Hubbard parameters looks like. And again, the clean system would be one tunneling energy and one interaction energy. And we typically wouldn't keep track of the site energy because it'd be the same everywhere. But now we have distribution. So here's probability distribution for those different Hubbard parameters. So the tunneling energies get broadened around um, the clean value. And that disorder is quite significant, actually. The, interact the interactions are only slightly disordered. So this is a particular case of quite strong disorder, almost maximum order disorder we can um, apply for a particular lattice depth. And there's only a tiny amount fractionally of disorder in the interaction energy. Most theorists, when they work on our system, typically ignore this. Actually, they often ignore this too, which is somewhat perilous, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then the site energies have this one-sided, exponential-like looking distribution. And you can also think of the disorder parameter delta here, or that strength, is measuring the standard deviation <coughs> of that distribution. OK, so the question that we've been picking away at for a while now in the system is what states emerge in 3D's disorder and interactions or tuning in the system? And so what I thought I'd do is tell you about what we know from experiments um, and give an overview of some past results. I'll go through them quickly, so you know, we can talk about that later if you have more questions. Those results are published. There's papers on those, too. Um, and I'm going to really take the point of view of experiments largely because theory and dynamics are quite limited in 3D. But at the end, I'm going to come back to a DNFT phase diagram from Walter Hofstetter's group and show you um, how our results fit together in kind of that framework. And then ask the question, how do we marry that to the idea of MBL? Which, in my mind, is, is sort of an interesting kind of open question. OK, so what do we know? So there is one um, theory thing we know um, about the system, and that's a single part of the mobility edge. So that was calculated by Sebastiano Pilati um, in 2015 and published in this paper. And here's um, that uh, the energy at which states start to become localized in the band. So the band closes from the top and bottom of the band until all the states are localized for a certain amount of disorder measured in the units of the tunnel energy. And um, this is a universal, since this is just single particle physics, this mobility edge is universal. That's why each parameter is scaled by the atomic energy. 
So this we know, although when this calculation was done, that off diagonal disorder, disorder in tunneling energy was not taken into account. That makes that problem very difficult. And um, the effect of that is something we still don't really know. Now this point here, so this is uh, 11 times the tunneling energy, which is required to close the whole band or localize all the single particle states. That actually is consistent with our measurements of localization for um, non-interacting gases, and we've never published those data, and for the weakest interaction strengths we, we um, consider for transport lanes. What's up? Is the mic not working? Oh, no, it's not working. It's on. Yeah, I the batteries. Right, so let me tell you about localization measurements next while we work on the microphone. And um, these are measurements we published back in 2015 where we were able to observe a metal insulator transition. So something else we know is that there is a metal insulator transition in the system. And let me tell you about that experiment again briefly here. Uh, so in those measurements, what we did is we tuned um, the gas to make putatively a metal, where we set the Fermi energy at half the bandwidth. Okay, so here's a picture of the crystalline one distribution. You can see the Fermi energy is a cold gas. It's well within the ground zone. We uh, vary temperature in this measurement. Central filling, we also vary. And um, you should think of this as a hot paradigm. There we go. And again, I'm just going to skim over these results so that we have some time to talk about the new stuff. All right, and then what we use in this measurement is order to identify a metal insulator transition as we turned on disorder. This was in a clean system, what this looked like. We use an impulse method that we first used to measure the, Bose, uh, the superfluid Bose blast transition in 3D. And in that measurement, all we do is we apply an impulse, a force, for a short period of time to the gas, and then measure the velocity afterwards, after that impulse. And all we say is that if the gas doesn't move its insulator and all the states are localized, if the gas moves and there's a velocity, it's something else, and we won't say what we should think of that as. So here's what those measurements look like. We start with a clean system, apply an impulse, and then the atoms move. This is, again, a crystal moment distribution, so there's net motion there. If we apply a lot of this order, the gas remains uh, motionless after we apply force to it, even though the Fermi energy or the apparent Fermi energy is well within the Brion zone. And so here are measurements of that center of mass velocity um, for varying amounts of disorder. This picture was taken way out here. And one way or another, we can determine a critical disorder. It doesn't really matter quite how we do this. The results are always qualitatively the same. To make that metal into a thing which is an insulator, which is consistent with, our, with um, zero motion within our experimental uncertainty. Okay. And uh, we're able to, working hard, the students work very hard, we're able to make this quite a, a fine measurement of um, the disorder required to localize uh, the system. So here's a sort of uh, phase diagram at low temperature for the system where disorders on this axis, interactions are on this axis, and um, what we're doing here is tuning a lattice step. We didn't access the Feshbach resonance in this measurement. And you can see here are different points for that critical disorder to cause that uh, metal insulator transition. So we were looking at the data in this direction, causing that transition to occur. And you can see at the weakest interactions, it's actually close to Sebastiano's result for the single particle um, limit uh, for the mobility edge. And also you can see that the amount of disorder required to localize the system here grows with interactions. So there's also an interaction mediated insulator metal transition in this system. Okay, so that's one thing we know is that there is an insulator metal transition here um, mediated by interactions and a metal insulator transition mediated by disorder. Okay, we also measured this in, as a function of temperature. So here's that center of mass velocity for a, a lot of disorder as we increase the temperature of the gas, and this, the, the system's always consistent with an insulator. Nothing ever moves. Right? Yeah? What, what, uh, the percolation line, is that just where there's a classically allowed path? <coughs> yes, that's right. Um, so this is not simple percolation physics. It would require a lot more disorder to shut off uh, simple percolation. Thanks for asking that question. No more questions. We're going to get to the new stuff. Um, and then the scale here is shrunk. Um, so again, this is an insulator independent of um, changes in temperature. OK, so all these results, I don't know what's going on with the screen here, but all these results are consistent with the BAA prediction for MBL, and this result was published in PRL. But more of what I want you to think about is this metal insulator transition and an interaction-mediated um, insulator metal transition.
we're going to take a very phenomenological approach here and just ask what do we know from experiments to the phenomenology that we've observed. Okay, so that was one set of measurements, something we know from experiment here. Another thing we know from experiment that I want to tell you about is that the clean metal in the system is, is a bad metal. Um, and I think I'm going to probably just try to go with this because I'm not sure. Here we go. That's a little bit better. Um, and let me tell you about these measurements. And there's an archive paper on this which hasn't been published yet. So this was a measurement um, that we did a couple of years ago to determine what's called the transport lifetime of the system. And all we did was we started with a spin polarized gas. We used to simulate a Raman transition to transfer some atoms to the other spin state, but shift it in momentum. And here's pictures of what that looks like. Here's the up state, and it's centered at zero momentum. Again, this is a crystal momentum distribution. The Brion zone shows up as a funny hexagon because of the imaging direction in our experiment. And then the down state um, here, you can see, is shifted in, in momentum and has a net momentum. And then all we did was do this measurement and wait different amounts of time and watch that net momentum decay. And we can take those data, we can fit them to a solution of the Boltzmann transport equation. And that time is exactly what's known as the transport lifetime from transport theory. And that time is the time which goes into, um, for example, a Druda model of um, resistivity, um, also, uh, which is also equivalent to um, every other version of resistivity. There's always a time which is there, um, which is the key element in any resistivity measurement. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through this very briefly. This is not really about disorder, which is why I'm going to go through it fast. So here's that transport lifetime measured in real units and then units of the atomic energy as you vary the temperature of the gas. So this is that fixed lattice depth. And here you can see something very funny happens in that the, as we turn up the temperature, um, the uh, transport lifetime gets shorter, or this decay of motion happens more quickly. And this is a truly bizarre thing to happen. And the reason for that is the density shrinking, the velocity stays about the same, and so this is incompatible with any quasi-particle picture. A weakly interacting trapped gas, and these are this is the kind of measurement Debbie and I did 20 years ago, um, would always the, trans the lifetime, the uh, decay time for this motion would always get longer and longer and longer. And actually, um, that's very simple if you just think about it in terms of binary collisions. I did a slightly more sophisticated theory here, a quantum calculation for this golden rule, taking into account um, uh, the trap and um, a binary scattering model, and that's what this black line is here. It also predicts the same kind of behavior. Um, and so you really can't understand this in any, any simple way. Okay? And, and in fact, there's not a good theory to compare this to. So the other thing we can do is we can extract for these kinds of data analog of resistivity. So how would you extract resistivity um, here if it was like an electronic system. And so what we can see is we can show that resistivity versus temperature. And um, again, the trap plus lattice, and sorry for the change in colors here, that's really what this black line is, would be independent of temperature on this axis. And um, we did our own DMFT using the TRIX toolbox. And if DMFT predicts that the um, resistivity should be linear in temperature here, and it's an OK fit for that, reduced chi squared to 1.76 for that kind of behavior. So this is consistent with T linear resistivity, which looks like a bad or a strange metal in the system in the clean limit. And if you want to read more about that, this is archive paper that maybe someday will get published in a journal. All right. OK, so what I wanted to do now, and um, spend 10 minutes on, and then take lots of time for questions, is a new measurement that we don't quite know how to interpret yet. OK, so I showed you that there's a metal insulator transition mediated by disorder. Um, for that disordered insulator, there's actually an interaction mediated insulator metal transition. Without disorder, the metal is a bad metal, and it shows displays t linear resistivity and anomalous transport properties. So another measurement we decided to do, we just completed this recently, is to look at double on lifetimes with disorder. And there's a lot of different reasons to think about why this would be interesting. Um, let me just talk about what people have seen in the clean limit first. So, in a clean limit, in a lattice, you can have double ons, okay, so doubly occupied sites here. And what we know from various measurements, not our measurements, but from measurements going back many number of years, and now many other people's measurements, is that in this clean system, when U is bigger than 12T, the decay of these double ons is protected by a gap, or they are repulsively bound. And the reason for that is that you can't, um, un you can't unbind one of these double ons because there's an energy mismatch. The interaction energy you have to give up if you take one of these particles and put it on the site next to it is bigger than the bandwidth, and there's no simple way to accommodate that energy. 
energy conservation energy momentum is in, from first look kind of impossible. Okay, so this was first measured by Grun's group using bosons, which is basically the same phenomenon, and SM group's group fermions, and many other people have measured this effect, including some people in this room. And um, there's been some theory work on this. This is an um, image I talk, took from Devon's group, because in fact these doublons do decay. They just decay with a very long lifetime. And the current theoretical understanding of this is they decay via generation of many particle whole pairs. So many interaction vertices are involved. You do need this background of singly occupied sites and empty sites. And basically this doublon, by shedding many, many excitations, through high, many interaction vertices can decay, but just with a long lifetime. So that's what happens in the clean system. And so we decided to ask what happens in the, in the dirty system if you add disorder, because we can imagine very different scenarios about how this would change and what information it gives you about the underlying physics and the underlying states. So what's a cartoon picture of what, like, how this picture might change when you add disorder? Um, and I'll come back to this at the end, we think maybe this is a method to probe a modern slater metal transition. Okay, so here's the potential scenario. It's all starting from this um, state where u is bigger than 12t. In that picture I just showed you. In that clean picture, we have a mod insulator. It's a little bit bigger than 12t. And you have a long lifetime, long double long lifetime. You can imagine if you add a little bit of disorder, maybe comparable to u, that resonances can develop. So for example, what can happen is there are places in this lattice where um, that interaction energy can be compensated by the difference in site energies. So for example, this particle can tunnel, tunnel over and, and, um, and conserve energy. And that double bond can unbind and conserve energy. And so what this leads to is actually some extended states developing in the system. And those extended states then connect like a bath, which allow the double bonds to rapidly decay. And this would probably be described as something like a metal. And actually, when you talk to, you know, I'm mostly surrounded by condensed matter people at Illinois. When you talk to condensed matter people, for them, it's an open question as to whether or not disorder can disrupt a, a mod insulator and give rise to something like a metal. And that's one way to imagine how it might happen. And actually, what I'd say is this story is very similar to the um, way that people talk about the mod insulator to pose glass transition for the um, bosonic system. What might happen then if you apply a lot of disorder, so disorder is the largest energy scale around, then you could just imagine that basically all states are simply localized, either trivially localized or Anderson localized, everything's frozen, nothing happens, nothing can decay, nothing can move, and you have back to an insulator again. So kind of what we want to look for here is an insulator metal insulator transition, and I'll come back to someone who predicted this quite a while ago, or a little while ago now. So we want to see what we'd see. So, so here's the measurement we do um, in the system. What we do is we prepare a gas with a, that's attractively interacting, so we can get some extra double bonds in the middle of that gas, always with a trap. We quench the interaction strength, so we flip very quickly the interaction strength to be positive, and at the same time we turn on disorder quickly. That's necessary here. Usually we turn on the disorder slowly with the lattice, and this system that wouldn't work, we wouldn't be able to see the double bond dynamics. Um, it doesn't seem to matter a whole lot how we do this, as long as we do it um, not too slowly. Then we wait as the double bonds decay. And then we use an RF transition to an ancillary, ancillary state, um, which is only, that transition is only resonant, re only resonant with states that are double bonds. So we flip one of those to a, a green atom. And we do spin selective imaging to read out um, what's in the lattice at this point. What we do is we count the number of doubly occupied sites by counting how many atoms will make that RF transition and the number of singly occupied sites uh, by seeing what's left. And then we fit these simultaneously to a model of double on decay to uh, extract the double on lifetime. It's a very simple rate equation type model where the doubles become singles and they both decay um, because there's always a loss present. And here's what we can see um, on a semi-log plot for that double on lifetime. This is a little bit bigger than u over 12t. This would be sufficient to have a mod insulator in the system. So here's that double on lifetime in units of the tunneling energy versus disorder, and this is in units of Rubel's energy. I apologize, we'll see why this is important not to normalize this in a minute. So the first thing you see is that you start with a relatively long lifetime um, in a clean system. That persists for a little bit of disorder, and then actually you don't have to apply much disorder, a few tenths of an ER here, and this double on lifetime collapses down to be almost the tunneling energy, which is sort of astonishing. We actually were not um, expecting that to become that fast. And as we apply more and more disorder, that lifetime gets longer and longer and longer again. 
you eventually exceed. What's that? You have five something here that you can actually change. By what? You change the, the, the interaction. Okay. That, uh, the, so the interaction strength has changed suddenly here. So I should go back and explain something for a minute here. Um, and this is not done very well with the slides. So what we're doing is we're setting up a system when u is less than zero, what we start with, there's more double ons expected in each of them <coughs> than the state where there are where the interactions are positive. So if the system can equilibrate the numbers of double ons with the clays, it's a very slight effect, actually. It's not a very big change in the double on fraction. And what I should say also is that everything we see is, is consistent with the equilibrium with disorder um, in a, from an atomic limit calculation. So what we see at the beginning and see at the end is consistent with the equilibrium. That's just a small decay in the number of double ons present. And that's why we switch the interaction. Version. What's the vertical scale? Uh, this is atom number and some units. Um, this is just atom number. <coughs> the zero is zero there. Uh, the zero is zero, yeah. So there's not a lot of double ones, and it decays to, uh, no, sorry, the zero is not zero. Okay, so this is a plot, the zero lies on here somewhere. I apologize. Um, so this is, decay, so typically this decays from about uh, 15 to 5% in number of double ones. Okay, give you an idea. So it's a small, it's not a lot of double ones, and then less double ones, but not a lot of double ones. Okay, so about 15 to 5% of the data. Okay, so this is what I was showing you in these data. Um, this is where U lies, so actually it doesn't take much disorder to disrupt the mock gap and have this collapse. And the other thing we did was we did lattice modulation spectroscopy here um, to find out what was happening from that perspective. So in the clean state right here, there's a peak in the double on response. It's close to U, okay, which is about what it should be like. Here, when there's a sh relatively short double on lifetime, that modulation spectroscopy produces a flat curve with no particular special modulation frequency. And as we turn the disorder up even higher, that remains flat. But in fact, there's more response, which is sort of interesting also. So what you're seeing here is something definitely which looks kind of gapped, like it's a mod insulator. It collapses to something which is not gapped. And then it picks up more and more modulation spectroscopy response as we turn up the disorder. How did you think about this? Actually, this is what we don't know. Right? Yeah. Thus, if you plot the amplitude of the background jump, so to say, from the beginning to the, to the, uh -huh. to the steady state, yeah. is it similar behavior? Because, I, I mean, no dabblons, yeah, you yeah. put them all, you you know, place most and put them all. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's happening across here is, in fact, the equilibrium number of dabblons is not changing much. Okay, and that's consistent with an atomic limit calculation. So it just turns out, for our parameters, um, the double on fraction at the beginning and the end of the measurement is not changing a whole lot. Here. Just turned out that way. Okay, um, so what's tempting to do here is say, well, we know at zero disorder there should be a mod insulator, so it looks like there's a mod insulator here, which is robust against a little bit of disorder. Maybe this is a metal here, and then I don't know what this state is. Here's some other data for stronger interactions. <coughs> This is, um, these interactions are made stronger through a combination of a slight change in lattice up from 12 to 15 ER, and then a change in the scattering length we jump to. But you can see there's different behavior. So there's a long lifetime. It's longer. It should be longer. Actually, the lifetime is exponential on this parameter. It's, again, robust against a little disorder. Then it gets faster, but not as fast at lower interactions. And in fact, it doesn't really change much, although the error bars here are pretty big, as we increase the amount of disorder. Again, we know this is a mod insulator down here, so this looks like something which is a mod insulator robust against small amounts of disorder. And then there's where U lies, and it turns into something, I'm not sure what this is. Okay, so this is um, a heat map of, of a lot of data that look like those data. Okay, so there's data all across here. These are the points we took at different double odd lifetimes. Here's, uh, it has a function of disorder in interactions normalized to um, the bandwidth. And here you can see this is a logarithmic scale or make it possible to see things here, but double on lifetime normalized to the tunneling time. And so you can see there's a bunch of features here. Here you can see what happens along this axis is that the double on lifetime gets longer and longer for the clean limit. Here's the data I showed you where there seem to be kind of three regimes. That's very similar. And so again, if I label things, it looks like there's a mod insulator here, which is robust to small amounts of disorder. Maybe there's a metal that lies in the middle here. And then states that I'm not sure actually what they are that lie at um, strong disorder. Okay, so um, 
one reason we would construct something that looks like this is because of DMFT that was done um, for this type of lattice uh, by Walter Hofstetter's group back in 2010. Because he knew sometimes, he knew that I were talking about. Um, so here's his prediction for um, that phase. His, this is a zero temperature phase diagram. This is equilibrium. These phases are distinguished by the local density of states of the Fermi energy, which is not what we're measuring um, in, in any of these measurements. Here's disorder. Here's interactions. You can see there's various features. There's a mod insulator, which of course shoots up somewhere on the clean limit for sufficient interactions. He predicts a mod insulator is robust against small amounts of disorder, turns into some kind of metal. And then he predicted that there's another kind of insulator which lies at high disorder, another transition. And again, I'm not sure you should believe this. I mean, Walter would say also it's DMFT, so you know you have to be careful if this is right or not. It's not clear that it um, can predict anything with high fidelity in the system. Is the horizontal axis also normalized to 12T, the band? Yes, I'm sorry, it is normalized to 12T, thank you, Richard. Yeah. Are the initial temperatures the same? What's that? Are all of your initial temperatures the same, or do you know? Uh, for the double end measurement, you know, this is a kind of highly excited state. Okay, so it's not particularly cold gas. It's a kind of excited state. But it's the same state every time. Yeah, it's the same state every time. Do you have those guys side by side? Sorry. What guys? Your, your um, future and his I, I could, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I can put that up. I can show that to you later. Um, what I, I, so, 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 so your measurement is being done for very large U over T. And, and also one thing. This, so this should be 12T. So Richard pointed out, I, I labeled this wrong. This is 12T. Okay. So we, we actually, go ahead, but go ahead. So, so, so and, and, and and for, for your experiments, the, 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 the low delta and low U, uh, do um, you see evidence of this disorder correlated metal as well there? Yeah, right. So what, what have we seen evidence for? So let me fill this in. I, I, I can put these on top of each other. I'm reluctant to do that. This is a ground state phase diagram. The thing I just measured is highly excited. Right. I, I didn't put these on top of each other on purpose. No, no, but, but, but the, on the low delta and uh, Yeah, so, so down it's here. Very wide space for you. Yeah, so, so down here, the transport measurements I started with, we see what looks like this transition that occurs at about the right place, actually. And notice the slope is positive, and we measure the positive slope here. Okay, so we see this boundary pretty clearly. Um, down here, at low, no disorder, we saw what looks like a bad or a strange metal. From the double end lifetimes, it kind of looks like we see maybe the full span here from this mod insulator to, the, um, to whatever you want to call this thing, through a metal. And uh, what I'd say is that we definitely, one thing that seems clear from the double end measurements is there's definitely something that's robust down here disorder. So it looks like this boundary is probably right. And then at higher disorder, we actually don't have enough disorder to get up here um, at higher interaction strength. And it looks like maybe we're seeing this transition through double end lifetimes. So I think this is kind of what we know from this phase diagram. And I want to wrap up to leave more questions here. Um, one thing I'd say is that you know, since this paper was published, um, people are thinking a lot more about MBL. And a question I, I think is, um, you know, when you talk about physics this way, or you talk about superfluid closed glass states, how should you connect that with MBL, and how do you think about that? Um, and so, how should we think about what this state is? So let me just end there so that we can have more discussion. Um, and as the summer just said, there's the people who did experiments in my group. Um, there you go. So let me end with that. Single ones, 
everything leaves. So there's definitely two time scales. And the long time scale of everything leaving, leaving is about two seconds, or 2,000 here, which appears up here. So you know, this is getting up close to that time scale over which just any particle seems to decay. It's not quite reached that yet. So if we just put particles in there, they leave because of heating and other things with about a 2,000 millisecond time scale. So we do see two time scales, but we independently measure it using a spin polarized gas, which is the decay time that is for these particles in there. And that's fixed in these fits. So out here, this does start to approach that, although it doesn't quite reach that. We don't see any evidence for that, no. So out here, um, so I, actually, I mean, for me, this is extremely exciting to see and try to understand what happens here. Maybe this is dominated by resonances, but it seems like that's resonances, which is allowing this very short time to occur. At some point, these resonances disappear, but there's a lot of disorder there. So maybe not possible to find resonances anymore. And it may just be really single site physics, which is coming in there. Although here, these lifetimes are still, these are not comparable to the clean system, so I don't really know. It's very interesting. So when you talk about hot insulator, yeah. um, is it really important? So you have all these single particle decay, also uh -huh. during the time of your experiment. Yeah. So are you, in what sense are you still half filled? Oh, it, it's not half filled. I mean, right, so there's. Um, so it would be hot insulator, maybe the wrong word. No, no, the zero temperature state or half millions of miles later. That's all I'm sure. So not the no, definitely not. No. So there's a gap. Um, it's some highly excited state on top of the lines layer. It's not half going. Right. So I'm only using these words to describe equilibrium states at low temperature in the uniform system because that's where those words mean. Right. Those words don't mean a lot outside of that context. That's all. Yeah. Um, so the error bars are those errors of fit, or are there other sources of? Those are the statistical error bars from the fit, um, and. We would love for them to be better, um, but uh, we're measuring these small changes in double infractions, so this is why the error bars are like this. Do you expect that to be the dominant source of error? Yeah, so I would say, so um, uh, we went through and looked carefully. Um, that's really the, the, there's some systematic errors here in what this is, okay? And there's an overall scaling on here, which generally, I would say, there's a systematic uncertainty at a 40% level, but that would be, and we try to be very honest about this. Okay, so that's the degree to which we're finding self-consistency in different ways to measure this. So in all our papers, we always say this, that you may want to rescale this by about 1.4 or one over 1.4. Okay, but that would be every point the same way. Um, there's some systematic uncertainty in U, which is relatively small. Um, there's some systematic uncertainty in T, which is relatively small. And then, but the, the statistical uncertainty really comes from that fit. Very good question. First of all, the, the, the temperature uh, in comparison ah. to the Fermi energy of the system where you are. Right. And the second thing, follow up, it will be can you do the same thing with the attraction pressure? Ah, um, great questions. Um, so, the Fermi, so this is a relatively hot gas, like many people who do these measurements. It's about T over T Fermi of 0.4. It wasn't particularly cold. And you know, when we do these quenches, we added in a lot of energy anyway. So you know, we didn't worry too much about that. We don't see it being particularly sensitive to that temperature. In these, um, these measurements. Um, I, the other thing is, in these particular measurements, um, these, there's about 45% uh, in the middle of the gas, it's about 45% double on, or not 40, it's about 50% double ons, 45% single ons, and the rest are holes. So there's a lot of excitation in the middle there. And that comes from that high amount of entropy per particle. Um, so th that's why I put the caveat on this. It's all kind of excited state physics, but I didn't want to overlay this with the ground state phase diagram. <coughs> You know, I'm not sure that really makes sense. Um, the second question is, we, do we try this in reverse? Yeah, so um, we, we could try this um, <coughs> switching to negative interactions of positive interaction. We could start with positive and go negative, and that would be interesting. We haven't done that. I, uh, well, the, the students did screw around a little bit, and they did look at that. They don't see terribly different things, but we haven't we've done really um, thorough measurements on that, so I, I don't know what to say, but that would be interesting. But also, if you load the temperature thing, Oh yeah, although I don't think anybody, no one no one believes it gets to that kind of temperature yet. Yeah. So yeah. So I think I missed that.
system, you said it, but these double on lifetime measurements, they're yeah. done in situ in the system? Or are they, what do you mean? Well, like, do you take a picture spatially of where the atom Yeah, they do. Or? They. That's right. But that's, <laughs> it's just atom counting. Right, yeah. Right. But is there any way that you can actually do some amount of averaging over where they are in the trap? And does it vary from um, place to place depending on like, the background density? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, right now, so we will do this soon. Right now, and in fact, one thing we want to do, another reason thing I'd love to do here is do double on transport measurements, but we need to look in situ because um, the band is sort of full here. We can't look at transport <coughs> plasma and we need to look you know, at mass transport in real space. So right now, we're not using the full imaging resolution of our experiment, so we're setting up a second imaging system, a higher magnification, which will be able to have a resolution of about two sites. So then, yeah, we, some resolution and some slicing, we could go in and see what they're doing spatially, and then actually also try to see mass flow of the double-ons, which I think would be pretty interesting to couple this measurement to that to see do the double-on transport properties and uh, do the double-ons. This is the signature of double-on localization in some sense. Yeah. Okay, question. So, um, yeah. I understand your, your, your thinking. The pronounced feature of this is the initial large drop. Did, did you say that? that it's hard to understand or, or, or it has been understood. But I, so so it, it, if it's hard to understand, it's because there's a, it's supposed to be forbidden by energy conservation. So what, what? Well, okay, so. And, and, and since you're not, I, my, I, my understanding is that you, 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 you at this, at the starting point, the system is not in equilibrium. If it's not in equilibrium, it's a yeah, it's, state. And then, so what is the surprise of this large job? I don't think that this is necessarily a surprise, um, but there's not um, a, a theory for this, right? So I can wave my hands and say, well, what I might believe happens here is a bunch of resonances develop, um, which allows the system to have a very short double on lifetime. So it's gapped, okay, which prevents the double ons from decaying. Um, and what I'm saying is a very hand wavy, right? So um, these resonances develop, which allow delocalized states to occur, which then provides a bath for the double ones that decay more rapidly. But that's hand wavy. There's not even a theory of this. Okay, so I would kind of expect that. Although that type of argument to me is always very fishy. This is the same argument that people use to talk about how a mod insulator can turn into a Bose glass when you, when you apply disorder, and it really requires these sort of rare regions to occur where resonances develop. But then somehow you need to have many of these rare regions um, so that the whole system becomes kind of unstable from one thing or another, right? So I don't know. So I, I, from one hand, point of view, this is not surprising this present. There's no theory for this that one can use to predict this. That's, that's what I mean. And actually, I find this high, this very, it, yeah, in any case, I mean, we see different kinds of phenomena, too, because the stronger interactions, you saw this jump, although something different happens here. And so how you should think about this, I don't really know. Okay. Yes, Brian needs water. Thank you. Thank you.